is the day that the Lord hath made. It is so good to see all of you, praise God, on this day. The early service, we had to dodge raindrops this morning and, and uh, met in the fellowship hall and um, we're blessed with, uh, at the early service, we are serving communion. We're not doing that in the big service because of COVID protocols, but um, we are in that smaller space. Usually it's outside and so we serve communion that way. Uh, so God really uh, blessed us. It's, but it, what a blessing it is to see all of you here uh, this morning. Um, had just a couple of announcements. Wanted to say thank you uh, to the folks that volunteered f- to uh, serve at the Word of Life uh, food pantry here in Roxboro. Uh, so appreciative. I know there's a couple of them here, and they're both humble, and so they don't want me to call out their names probably. Uh, but we had three folks in addition to me that helped the other ministers with the Ministerial Alliance give the regular volunteers there some time away. Uh, it's a reminder, most of the work that we've done here is with the Christian Help Center food pantry right across the parking lot. And uh, for everyone who was there to serve those folks over at the Word of Life Pantry, it's, it's just a reminder of how many hungry people there are uh, in our county, in our community. Um, and so I ask for your prayers and that you'd continue to just ask God, how can I serve, how can I help those uh, in need? Um, so uh, thank you to those that, that uh, volunteered. Um, thank you. Also, just a word of thanks. I know we're getting ready to go back into public school, and uh, so prayers with all the teachers and administrators and parents and kids that are out there. Uh, it is a difficult time. There's still uncertainty in terms of how that's going to work with COVID, I think, to some extent. So please pray for those uh, that precious, precious uh, job that we have as a community to educate our uh, youngest uh, our youngest folks. We are um, uh, celebrating. I'm not going to tell you why these flowers are here because I've been asked not to make a big deal out of it, but read it in your bulletin and let's all, without me saying it, let's clap and say how happy we are for whoever those... <laughs> for the only two people that weren't just clapping in the whole congregation. Uh, God bless those two people and... Uh, Uh, May God uh, continue to um, uh, bless them, and they're such an inspiration to all of us. Um, uh, Tommy, we're glad that you are singing the anthem this morning. I want to announce something to you that um, I'm pretty sure that not many, if if any, folks know this morning, Um, and that is that um, uh, Tommy Day passed away last night, was in hospice care, uh, and so I just got word that that happened. Pam, our children's minister, uh, is, is Tommy and um, Nancy's daughter-in-law, and uh, she is with them this morning. Our prayers are with them, uh, and so please keep uh, the Day family in your prayers, uh, Nancy and Bradley and, and their extended family. Uh, because of that, we also heard this morning that April Duncan, our child care worker, is out with a migraine, so if you can help us, if someone comes in that has children in the nursery and you see them kind of looking around like what is going on. Uh, Jonna is, has volunteered and offered uh, Jonna Fitzgerald to go back there. So help us grab Jonna so that we can meet those families' needs. It was kind of a perfect storm of, of um, um, uh, situations this morning. So thanks be to God. Um, our Just a, one more word that it is uh, getting to be the time of Uh, departure for our interns here in the month of August. They'll go back to Duke and start studying again. We've been so blessed by their presence, and uh, we're still kind of figuring out the last Sunday and how that's going to work, but uh, we've been grateful for them. So please uh, just know to take a moment, perhaps, lift them up in prayer as they go about their uh, their studies and their future ministry, and uh, if you get a chance, let them know how much you appreciated their uh, presence with us. So I certainly have. It's been a blessing to work alongside. This isn't goodbye yet, but I'm just telling you that we're kind of getting towards that end of the summer. So um, um, those are the announcements I have. 
I think I've covered all the things uh, that are out there. One, well, one more, and that is that those of you that are on the regular communication list, especially the email list of the church, uh, this week we're going to be sending out a survey about how you feel about our current protocols, uh, especially in light of the Delta variant that's coming up. Um, and um, what we might need to do, do we need to get rid of some, at least in some sections of the sanctuary, like the tape between pews, or just what we should do going forward. Uh, so um, uh, please look for that via email is how we're going to send that out. And if you'd like to request one, if you're not on email, you can contact the church office. We'll try and get it to you anyway, those of you that aren't on email, so that you can participate and give us that feedback. Um, it is in the bulletin, but I want to announce um, that today's pray on behalf of Jana, today's prelude is dedicated to the West Virginia Annual Conference, who inspired Jana with their robust four-part singing of the tune that she's about to play, Diadem, which you might recognize as All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. They sing that every year at their annual conference in West Virginia at Wesleyan uh, Church in Buckhannon, West Virginia. Uh, and so... Uh, we thank God for their witness there in West Virginia. And uh, the, the tune, the words, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Maybe you can sing that in uh, your hearts as you uh, enter into a spirit of worship uh, during this time uh, as we prepare our hearts for worship in this prelude. World, enable us to be still and know that you are God. O Lord, who answers out of the world and every life, breathe on us your Holy Spirit to strengthen, comfort, and guide us amid the storm. 
O still, small voice, speak to us this hour, that we might become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, in our world. We pray this all in the name of the one who calmed the raging sea. Amen. Let us pray. God, as we come to you today in worship, we ask that we would come before you in humility, knowing that you are the source of all our strength, while also granting us the confidence to proclaim your word, knowing that each one of us is made in your likeness and image. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn is found on page 154 of your hymnals. remain standing as we confess our faith together using the words found on page 881 in your hymnals using the words of the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth I believe in Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate died and was buried the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, beginning in the 24th verse. It reads, So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do? What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the bread, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our uh, anthem this morning is sung by Tommy Humphreys. Uh, it's called He. <laughs> He can turn the tides and calm the angry sea. He alone decides who writes a symphony. He lights every star that makes our darkness bright. He keeps watch all through each long and lonely night. He finds time the time to hear a child's first prayer. Saint or sinner call and always find him there. It makes him sad to see the way we live. He'll always say, I forgive. He can grant a wish or make a dream come true. He can paint the clouds and turn the gray to blue. He alone knows where to find the rainbows in. He alone can see what lies beyond the bend. He can touch a tree and turn the leaves to gold. He knows every lie that you and I have told. Though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he'll always say, I forgive. 
thank you, Tommy, and thank you, Jana. Uh, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, and may you fill us fully with your spirit. May you fill us to the brim and even running over with your bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So it's the first Sunday of the month. Uh, at the early service, it was Communion Sunday, and um, it's a very important day. We have many feelings to attend to. Uh, we, this is a congregation, certainly, I think, that strives to live by the Spirit of God, strives to serve our neighbors, strives to love one another. And so hearing news, for example, that our beloved Tommy Day passed away is something that just fills all of our hearts with sadness and uh, and also hearing a beautiful anthem fills our hearts with joy and, and love for one another and renews our faith. We're here today, I think, because we need to be here. We have concerns to share. We have a shared life to live together. Um, we are, uh, I think, here today because we were invited to be here by God's very spirit. Think about that for a moment, that it wasn't just you that said, you know, I think I'm going to go to church today. It was actually God, the Holy Spirit, the very spirit that moved over the waters of creation in the beginning of time, the very spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, resurrected him, is the same spirit that said, hey, Bob, come to church today. Wear that nice pink jacket that you've got. The Spirit of God. Uh, we are hungry for something, though. We're thirsting for something today. Despite saying in our affirmation of faith that we believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ our Lord, the truth is that we live in a world that is filled with a longing for something that it doesn't yet have. Even though the world has such bounty and abundance there are things that are not quite right. In fact, they often seem wrong, despite advanced technology and medicines and vaccinations and better crop yields and spirit-filled churches. There's still things that don't seem quite right in our world. And so we are here and we are asking, what's going on? I think that's a part of why we are uh, here this morning. A neighbor of ours here in Person County asked for a church recommendation out on social media this last week. He said, where can I go on Sunday morning where I will feel the spirit from the moment I walk in uh, until the moment I walk out of those doors? In every person I encounter, in every word of worship, in every note that is sung, will I find the Holy Spirit there? Where will I find Jesus? He was looking for something more Something like good bread, I think, if you're hungry. Where can I find the good bread, uh, the bread of life? And I wonder what we would say to that neighbor if, if we saw that post out on social media. You'll surely find him here? Or maybe some of us would wish him well and join him on his quest looking for some place where he would find the Spirit of God, where we would find the Spirit of God. Or maybe, maybe some of us would say, I got a place, come sit next to me because I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what, the Spirit of God is certainly here. What's going on in this world? What's going on when someone is perhaps living the lifestyle they've always dreamed about? with a spouse and a child and a dream home and a well-paying job, but their marriage is falling apart. What's going on? I, when Jackie and I were on our uh, trip up to Maine just a few weeks ago, there was a little port in uh, Maine somewhere, I think it was called Belfast, Belfast, Maine, this little harbor town, and parked in the marina was a huge boat that would barely, it was a yacht, someone's personal yacht, and it would maybe fit in this sanctuary. It was a big, nice-looking thing. We looked it up due to the power of the internet, $11 million. You could, uh, uh, if you had that burning a hole in your pocket, you too could have one of those. And the name of the boat was One More Toy. There's something just kind of sick about that, you know? Um, nonetheless, I invited him to come to church here, so maybe he could tithe. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I didn't. That was just a joke. Uh, but there's something that's just... One more toy? A great big boat? I don't know. Well, uh, 
What's going on in the world? What's going on when you're making all A's and B's in school and you're in two sports in an honor society, but you don't feel like you can get out of bed? While we're at it, what's going on when we can't seem to cure COVID or cancer or AIDS or to save the world's masses from treatable diseases like tuberculosis or malaria or when we can't even protect our very own communities from domestic violence? There's a hunger out there in the world for something more satisfying. We've got so much as a people, as a nation, as a community, but there's still so much that isn't yet right. What is it with this world? What is it with our life? What makes me unable to get into the car and endure 10 seconds or a minute of relative silence without having to turn on the radio to quiet down the quiet so I can be distracted? We don't want to be alone with ourselves, let alone with God. So many people find aloneness without peace. They find charity without justice. They find success without integrity. They find status without responsibility. They find work and toil without vocation and calling. So many people find distraction and entertainment without joy, even sex without love. There's something more though. What have they missed? What have we missed? We are hungry and we are sitting here, some of us like empty shells after so many unsatisfying episodes and we think that there must be something more. We've got so much in our society and yet it doesn't seem to satisfy. At the first impulse of hunger, I can drive right around the corner. I can order a meal just by number. I'll take the number two meal, for example, and suddenly my food is waiting for me in a bag. It's a hamburger with Brazilian beef, Chilean ketchup, Idaho fries, Kenyan coffee. It's already in my stomach by the time I get back to the office. Maybe I'm the only one. The entire meal, assembled from all over the world, thought of, ordered, paid for, received, eaten, and trash thrown away in about five minutes, and still I don't feel satisfied. I had it at my fingertips. I consumed it in record time, and I don't, in fact, that kind of meal, I probably feel kind of sick after I eat it. And I'll go back and do it again when I'm pressed for time again, even though I didn't feel Great. What's going on? I'm still hungry. Or is it just me? Contrast that kind of meal, that fast food meal, with this depiction from a classic Russian novel about a hungry political prisoner in a harsh Siberian concentration camp. It says, it, it makes me think it's cold just saying the words. It's from the book called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn which is a mouthful, and please don't ask me to spell it. Here's what he said in this one scene. His hungry belly called out to him to eat the bread that he had hidden away in his jacket. And then he reached for that hunk of bread wrapped in a piece of clean cloth and holding the cloth at chest level so that not a crumb should fall to the ground. He began to nibble and chew at the bread. The bread which he had carried under two garments had been warmed by his body. The frost that surrounded him hadn't caught it at all. More than once during his life in the camps, he had recalled the way that they used to eat in his village before he'd been arrested, whole pots full of potatoes, big chunks of meat, and milk enough to burst their guts. But that wasn't the way to eat, he learned in camp. You had to eat with all your mind on the food, like now, nibbling the bread bit by bit, working the crumbs up into a paste with your tongue and sucking it into your cheeks. And how good it tasted, that soggy little morsel of bread. That's the end of the quote. In the midst of nothing, that character found something more satisfying. And that is not at all the way I eat that $5 bag of a number two meal We can't relate much anymore to that Russian story. Around here, it's more like my fast food version. It reminds me of, of, this is an actual conversation I had with my grandfather on his farm in the winter. When I was growing up, I'd go to his farm and uh, it would be this winter wonderland. In Michigan, there'd be two and three feet of snow on the ground and we'd love to watch the deer. 
and you could see the deer really well. There's no leaves on the trees. You could see them from a long ways away. They're brown bodies walking across the white snow-covered fields. And uh, it was so much snow that winter that the deer in the country were having trouble finding food buried so far beneath. And I wanted to help them. So I suggested to my grandfather that we go buy some corn and we spread it on top of the snow. Now, I don't know if what he said to me is true or not, whether it was scientific or not, but it's true on a different level. He wasn't always the best at science. (laughs) Wasn't always. But there was a truth to this, regardless of if it applied to the deer or not. He said we couldn't put corn on top of the snow for the deer to eat because we would be killing them with our good intentions. He said the deer's stomachs in the winter became conditioned and toughened to eat the tough bark off of the trees during the harsh winter. And they were so hardened, those stomachs, to that harsh diet that they couldn't absorb the nutrients from the readily digestible corn. They would eat the corn, but then they would soon die of malnutrition. They would starve to death with full stomachs, he said. Again, I don't know if you look that up on Google. I've never done it. I don't know if you'd find out that's true or not, but it's true on a different level of understanding so many in our world. They would starve to death with full stomachs. We live in a culture where so many of our neighbors are starving with full stomachs. Of course, we also live in a place where the other extreme is true. While many of us have full stomachs and we're lacking satisfaction and meaning for our lives, plenty of our neighbors' pantries, physical pantries, are bare. The pandemic nixed many jobs. Entry-level jobs for hardworking people sometimes don't pay enough to pay the rent and buy food and diapers and transportation and health insurance and doctor's fees on top of that. There are multi-generational patterns of poverty that start the newest generation out with a tough climb and the mountain only seems to get steeper. Sometimes governments step in to try and ease some of the burdens, but the efforts are limited or temporary, or even sometimes misguided. Sometimes it's not just empty hearts, it's also empty bowls and empty bank accounts and empty gas tanks and empty stomachs. Well, I focus so much perhaps on food because that's what the people in this story are asking Jesus about. When we think back to the gospel lesson that Colby read this morning, it's in the same chapter as Jesus feeding the 5,000. Remember that story? 5,000 people came to listen to what Jesus had to say. The disciples said, hey, Jesus, if we don't send these folks home, we're going to have to feed them, and we don't have anything to feed them with. And Jesus said, go, find what you have to feed them. And they found the loaves and the fishes, and you know the rest of the story. Jesus did the miracle and fed all of the 5,000, and there were leftover baskets. And the people are hungry. They're hungry for that again. And again and again, who wouldn't want more food if it was given out that way? And not only that, but they want to be around Jesus. Now, right after Jesus fed the 5,000, he sent the disciples away to the other side of the big lake. It wasn't like a hiko lake. It was more like a, uh, like, I don't know, a big lake. <laughs> I don't know, like the, uh, I can't think of something, like the noose way down by, the, by Camp Don Lee, you know? Like, it was a big lake, really wide. He couldn't just walk around to the other side. So they watched Jesus stay and the disciples leave in their boats. And there were no more boats. But when they went to find Jesus, he was gone. You see, Jesus in the middle of the night, they didn't see him. But he had gone across the lake too. He just didn't feel the need to take a boat. (laughs) He just walked on water. Uh, But they didn't see that. So they went looking for him. And they said to him, hey, they found him and the disciples. And they said, how'd you do that? Do another trick, Jesus. Do another trick. Give us some more bread. Walk on some water. Do another disappearing act. We want to see you do another trick. How did you do that? Now, Jesus didn't give them the answer to their question. But he redirected them to the substance of the story. He instructs them, cautions them not to clamor for things that perish, but to work for food that endures for eternal life. Jesus is saying that there is something more than a few morsels of bread and fish. There is something more than figuring out how Jesus got to the other side of the sea. 
Something more than feeding many with little. Jesus says, it's not just about the miracle that you saw yesterday, it's about me. Jesus said, I'm the miracle. I'm the one sent from God to reveal God's word. Believe in the one the Father has sent. Believe in me. But the crowd, they're not convinced. Now we can relate to that. We say as Methodists all the time to the whole world, God is love. Come here. We love you. You can discover God's love. And so far, the people aren't beating the doors down. (laughs) Right? The crowd isn't convinced. Do another trick, they say, so that we might believe in you. Remember, and now they're trying to quote scripture. Have you ever had someone quote scripture to try and persuade you to like do another trick or do something like that? Moses gave our ancestors manna from heaven every day. And that's why we believe him, they imply. But Jesus is quick to pick up on their confused, over-hungry thinking. Maybe they were getting hangry. He reinterprets their story. He says, it wasn't Moses who gave you bread from heaven. It is God who gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God, that God gives, gives life to the world. But now, so now the people are starting to get it and they're still looking for tangible morsels. morsels. They say, well, give us this kind of bread always, please. They still want the morsels. They, they still want the corn on top of the snow. Maybe I've told this story before. Maybe not. I'm getting old. I'm 50 now. I can't remember things. But in my former career, before I was a pastor, I was involved, very involved, in the effort to try and fix the Y2K bug. I bet some of you worked. Anybody work on that Y2K bug? There's one over there. A couple of you. Yeah. It was a mess, wasn't it? I mean, it wasn't fake. <laughs> We, the reason the world didn't end, I think, is because folks like you fixed it, right? <laughs> but I remember I was very involved in that, and there was a moment of panic I had at my kitchen table, and I was thinking, because remember, the world is ending, all those things. You won't be able to get food. You won't be able to get money out of the bank. You can't make a reservation. Your bank won't know what balance you have. You won't be able to get gas because the trucks are going to stop. Like, everything was going to go wrong. Well, I finally got caught up in a moment of panic. And I was like, God, what am I going to do? How am I going to keep my job? What if we can't get food? How am I going to fend up? Maybe I need to learn how to grow wheat in my front yard, you know, so that we can grow it, grind it, make some, you know. What am I going to do? And I, it doesn't happen very often, but it happened that morning when I was asking God that question. God kind of spoke, not, not quite audibly, but in that time of prayer when I was lamenting, when I was pouring out my fears to God, God said essentially to me, He didn't crack the heavens open, but I just sort of had this conversation. He said, oh, tell me more, Ed. How did you get your job on your own? How do you provide for your family on your own? Please tell me, Ed, how do you keep a roof over your head on your own? Do you do that all on your own? God was basically saying, if you want to keep doing things on your own, Ed, have at it. I'll be glad to let you. Of course, God didn't want me to say, yeah, I, Ed, got all this stuff on my own. God wanted, and and you can see through the example, right? God wanted me to acknowledge that it was God that gave all the blessings in the first place, had me meet the right people, had me say the things that helped me get the job, gave me the skills to do that job, provided for my family using the mechanism, the means of that job and the salary and all that kind of thing. But all of God's gifts come from God. And so God said to me, essentially, why don't you trust me? Why don't you trust me? I'll continue to provide for you. I'll let you do it all by yourself if you want. Good luck with that, as I think God taught Dr. Phil to say. You know, how's that working for you? He would say, I've never abandoned you before, and I don't plan to do it now. And so the panic subsided, and I think that I just received in that moment a morsel of the bread of life. Have you ever had such a moment? When you've tasted a little bit of the bread of life, a little message from God that shows you that you don't have to worry about what you should wear or what you should eat or where you should live, but God's going to provide and take care of you. Jesus says it then. 
in the gospel lesson. As clearly as it could be said, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, Jesus didn't say this, but it's true. That's not to say that it might not get a little lean sometimes. When we pray, give us this day our daily bread, I don't think any of us who have money in the bank or 401ks for retirement or adequate salaries or parents or children that we can depend on, I don't think any of us really want that prayer to come true where God only gives us our daily bread and takes away all the other stuff like insurance policies and things to kind of give us a little cushion should we fall out of the sky somehow. But that's what we pray. Give us today our daily bread. When Moses gave manna in the wilderness, how much did he give them? He gave them enough for that day. If they tried to collect more, it would spoil as a way to teach the Israelites how to just depend on God day by day by day. It can get a little lean. Sometimes, you know, we do live check to check or meal to meal. I've heard statistics that somewhere between 25% and 50% of the children in our county experience the anxiety and fear of not being sure they'll be able to eat every meal. The backpack pals that this church is involved in providing give somewhere near 5,000 items of food weekly to kids in our county, in the public schools. 5,000 items of, of food. 250 kids, about 20 items of food a weekend. I mean, like, an item of food would be like a little pear packet, a little fruit cup, or, uh, or a little mac and cheese box, or something that they can just heat up in the microwave. 5,000 every week, all school year. Thanks be to God for the good folks that donate and glean and collect and sort and pack the, and deliver the food in those backpacks. In, they are God's hands, those folks, giving others this day their daily bread. So back to our scripture. Jesus says it clearly, as clearly as it could be said. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That, I think, is Jesus was talking about something that Paul Tillich, the theologian, calls our ultimate concern. That's what he talks about, real faith. It's the condition of being ultimately concerned. We are created thirsty, hungry people. Our souls long to be satisfied. Many things can satisfy our, our bodies in the short term, at least for the time being, but the object of our ultimate desires will ultimately fail us if that object is not ultimate, if it isn't God. That's a lot of theology speak. I'm looking around. Is there a music stand someplace? I guess they're all gone. There's one over there. Can you picture a music stand? I should have done my homework and got it ready. You know, the thing, it's just black, kind of flimsy. Put your music on it. A podium that's just a stick that goes down to the ground. I can depend on that stick, that music stand to hold this paper. But if I needed to climb on that music stand to change a light bulb... Don't think that would work out very well. Do you? I can depend on it for some things, but I can't depend on it for everything. Food might fill up my belly for a bit, but it's not the ultimate concern. Jesus is the bread of life. It is the ultimate concern. The crowd in Jesus' day was seeking an unsatisfying answer, an unsatisfying piece of knowledge. How did you get to the other side of the lake? Another mere morsel of bread. It was like entertainment or trivia. Let's see Jesus give us manna from heaven like Moses did. That'd be cool. We'd take a selfie with it. It's as if they were saying. But what they were really needing is that they... They needed to look no further. They just needed to believe. They needed to believe in Jesus. They didn't need to wait on the same hillside where they were yesterday for another miraculous feeding. It wasn't going to come. They don't need to dwell, to look into the past and dwell on the memory of bread that perished. They can dwell in the present and recognize that feeding on Christ is all they will need. Coming to Christ is putting faith in the ultimate subject, the subject worthy of ultimate concern. In communion, when we celebrate it, when we consume Christ, when we eat the bread of life, we begin this journey of satisfaction. 
Our physical hungers will return. Our ailments, our depressions, our illnesses, our frustrations. But the ultimate hunger, the spiritual hunger, is satisfied. And the the satisfaction of that spiritual hunger leads to more and more life. If we have the bread of life and we encounter a neighbor who is hungry and who is a child made in God's image, we begin to be dissatisfied that that kind of state of living could continue to go on. And so the bread of life that we consume out of love for our neighbor starts to feed the world. The healing doesn't always come the way we think it should. Very rarely are the chronic conditions of our day, of our bodies, miraculously removed. There are many accounts throughout history of even whole communities of righteous monks and nuns beset by some contagious disease that ravages the Jesus-believing family. Just because we take into ourselves the bread of life doesn't make us perfectly immune to all diseases and ailments of forgetfulness and, and hopping along on one bad leg or two. In this time of the pandemic... We've received communion very sparsely, but we still commune together by the power of the Holy Spirit. The early service this morning, we received communion. We can perhaps remember the last time that we did. May we savor the morsels of living bread because sometimes that living bread comes to us through communion in God's presence with us. But I promise you with every bit, an ounce of being in me, that we don't need that bread and that juice in order to experience the communion of God. That the love that we share right now, this being honest with ourselves, sharing this space, sharing this compassion for one another, that too is holy communion. May we savor those morsels of living bread of which we partake. May we, re- may we remember Christ's presence with us in all of our trials, May we remember Christ's forgiveness in all of our falling down. May we remember God's act of love for us. May we remember the healing that flows through the church. May we remember the unity of all God's children, able and disabled, joyous and hurting, self-centered and selfish, healthy and chronically in pain, confident and fearful, rich and poor, dark and light skin. May we remember it and may the Spirit of God so consume us that when someone asks out there in social media or on, up on Main Street somewhere or a neighbor of ours, you know where I could find a church that is filled with God's Spirit? Without hesitation, we might say, come sit next to me. You'll see the Spirit of God is alive and well in the church to which I belong. And may we all find Christ, in Christ our ultimate satisfaction the very bread of life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we are a praying people. In prayer, we are sharing in communion. We are sharing in prayer in the very body of Christ. And so we have a a fair list of folks to pray for here this morning. Uh, As I mentioned before, we pray for uh, the family of Tommy Day, for Nancy, for Bradley, siblings. Uh, We pray for um, uh, and are just great to see Helen Starr continue to recover. Uh, And um, we pray for Ron Johnson, um, for Ronnie King. We continue to pray for you and Barbara. We pray for Fran and John Westmoreland, for Norma Sabiston, for our brother Ted Mickey. We pray for Jean Andrews and Roland Crawley, for Betsy Warren and Ralph Lewis, for Caitlin Sewell and Rob Fitzgerald, for April this morning, uh, as, that she would recover from her migraine and get back on her feet again. We pray for my wife Jackie's son Connor and his wife Taylor as they await the birth of their baby next month. Uh, we pray for, I was asked to pray for the families of Susie Eggleston, Joyce McCullough, and Harold Art Thornton. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for the family and friends of David Long, who uh, moved away from uh, this church and community some time ago. Uh, a memorial service is going to be held for uh, David's extended family here uh, this coming Saturday. So our prayers are with them in their grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others that we would uh, lift up in prayer this morning? I would invite you to share their names. Are there uh, names and concerns that you have that are within your hearts that you haven't said aloud? I'd ask you, you could just raise up a hand and we could be in prayer for those unspoken requests. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I would invite you to come and share a pastoral prayer with us. Oh, yes, other side of my seat, Uh, for the kids uh, that are going back to school and for the teachers uh, and administrators, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. For those who are already have succumbed to this new variant of the COVID virus, for those uh, that are worried about what to do, for frontline workers uh, in healthcare um, and in uh, who face the general public, Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. And we pray also for all of those landlords and tenants uh, who have been perhaps uh, uh, affected by, uh, for some, what seems like really goodness, the the moratorium on evictions, but which that moratorium has been difficult for landlords. uh, And I have seen just in the news recently that some of those protections might be ending, which will uh, create situations of potential homelessness and distress. Uh, And so just for the whole situation, for everyone uh, who provides and needs homes that might be in uncertainty, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, would you share a prayer with us? Will you pray with me? God, it's so easy for us to to just go through the motions of spirituality. We want to say the right prayers and think that we have found the magical key to make holiness appear in our lives. But we are empty, Lord. We hunger and we thirst for something that will sustain us through all the times of our lives. We chase after things that will disappoint and hurt and look past the very thing that will heal and cleanse our lives. Christ is your bread of life, the manna from heaven, which was and is sent to feed and sustain us and all the wildernesses through which we travel. Help us to stop running after the glitz and the glitter, the easy wealth. Help us to look truly for the one who will quench our thirst and nourish our souls. As we have lifted up names of people and situations which lay heavy on our hearts today that need your healing touch, help us to remember that we stand continually in need of your healing mercy. Bring us to you, God, with open and repentant hearts for your loving care. As we receive the the wondrous gift, um, as we remember the bread and the wine. May we truly be reminded that Christ nurtures and feeds us with his own life. When we have been nourished, may we go from this place in renewed commitment to serve you, God, with our very lives. It's in Christ's name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It has begun, it become our practice during this time of this pandemic to join together, even if we cannot uh, uh, receive communion together inside like this, uh, to still pray the prayer of confession that we would also uh, incorporate into our service um, 
it's important for us, uh, God asks us to confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness. And so uh, uh, we pray that together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. It was true yesterday. It's true today. It will be true tomorrow. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. As a forgiven and reconciled people, before we, uh, let's stand for the hymn that we're going to sing. But as you stand, look at one another and you can say either uh, to one another, greet them with, in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. You can also share the peace of Christ with them. Peace of Christ with you too, Joe. God has given to us first. Um, we encourage you, if God has laid it on your hearts, to give and contribute to the work of the church, that you would leave an offering on your way out of the sanctuary in just a few moments. Uh, but we still give thanks to God for all of his many gifts. We'll use the, uh, the song, the doxology, in order to, to offer God our praises for his blessings. Blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures hear me alone. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power of bliss. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia. closing hymn is Take My Life and Let It Be, one of the great hymns of the Methodist tradition. Number 399. Take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee Take my moments and my days, let them flow in a ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. 
have indeed received the very bread of life this morning. In the beauty of the smiling faces all around us, even those behind their masks, we have received the joy that comes with being in a fellowship of believers. And so we take that bread of life and we become baskets to hold the bread of life and to share it with a world that is very, very hungry. Go from this place in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen.